Coming up next, Megan Maroney and I talk with Tim Stevens from CNET's Roadshow all about all of the biggest car and autonomous vehicle stories, all sorts of car tech stories from throughout the year of 2016. That's up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1670, recorded Friday, December 2nd, 2016, for Tuesday, December 27th, 2016. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is our holiday, one of our holiday editions. And so this is a show where we talk about one of the biggest topics of the year. And today we're going to talk about cars, self-driving cars, yeah. ride sharing, ride hailing, um, cars that run on bubblegum, all, all the things. <laughs> I didn't see that one, so I'm very curious to know what okay. you come up with for the, the bubblegum story. Uh, I'm Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell. Joining us to talk about all this stuff Good friend of the show, just an awesome guy all around. Tim Stevens from CNET's Roadshow. How's it going, Tim? Uh, it's going very well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Always a pleasure getting you on the show. And this is like perfect for what you do. We were talking prior to the show about the fact that you test so many cars because it's, it's part of your, your job. I test a lot of phones, so I always have a new phone that I use you know, regularly. You have new vehicles that are just parked in your driveway. Like, hey, I've got this new car for a week. No big deal. Yeah, yeah. And the neighbors all start to question exactly how they're affording new cars and wondering what you're doing on the side. And, and that raises some interesting conversations at the uh, the local get togethers and that kind of thing. But yeah. yeah, it's definitely a nice perk of the job. It just means that I don't get to drive my own car very often, which is actually yeah. a little bit of a bummer sometimes. I hear you on that, especially. And you don't get to do unboxing videos either. That's true. Yeah, yeah also true. <laughs> well, they should send these to you with a big bow on top like we see in all the Christmas um, advertisements every year. So, <laughs> Yeah, and throw it in the trunk afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get started. Since the landscape for cars is changing so fast, I thought we'd start at the beginning of the year. Uh, and this was the year that traditional car companies began to invest seriously in self-driving technology and car sharing. In early December of 2015, Uber's valuation was uh, supposedly $62.5 billion, and that had meant that it would officially eclipse the market value of General Motors, which was $56.2 billion. And GM decided to do something about it starting in January with General Motors' $500 million investment in ride-hailing company Lyft. Then later that month, they started their own car sharing service, Maven. And then in November, General Motors struck a deal with Uber to provide short-term leases for drivers. So General Motors was all over the place. Uh, what's going on with them now, Tim? Yeah, GM also spent a billion dollars to acquire a company called Cruise, uh, working on uh, autonomy advances as well. So GM definitely spent a lot of money this year. Uh, basically, they're they're kind of hedging their bets. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of fear and a lot of concern in in the Detroit metro area and and ultimately in the auto industry as a whole that. With services like Uber and Lyft getting more popular, that maybe people aren't going to be owning and buying cars, at least not like they used to. Um, and if that changes up the economy in a big, big way, they kind of need to be prepared. So we're seeing a lot of experiments when it comes to ride sharing and car sharing. Um, some companies like BMW are launching their own services. Uh, other companies like uh, like GM, as you mentioned, trying to kind of get on board with established players like Lyft uh, and trying to make sure that they are well positioned there as that goes forward. Um, but ultimately, I think what you're seeing is a lot of a lot of key investments in a lot of places as companies are trying to figure out what the next big thing for transportation is going to be. Because ultimately, you know, GM and Ford and, and all those guys, their markets and their companies haven't really evolved all that much in the past 50, 60 years. You know, the, the industry has been relatively stable, at least compared to everything else that's going on in the world. Um, but now, you know, they can see the writing on the wall. They can see that things are going to be shaken up in a big, big way. Uh, in the very near future. And so they want to make sure that, that they're hedging their bets as much as they can. And, and it's part of that is spreading some money around while they got it. So do you see this as a good thing for the industry? Um, I mean, money and just established companies getting involved? Yeah, it, it definitely is. I mean, on one hand, it adds a lot of credence and a lot of weight to the idea that Uber and Lyft are going to be major players and they're not just, you know, quick hits. Um, the fact that GM was willing to drop that amount of money just for a portion of the company shows that they are very convinced that this is a company that's going to be around for a long time. Uh, and I think that that definitely shows that that idea of car sharing, that economy is definitely going to be a major player. 
Uh, and especially as we go forward and look at more autonomy, which we're going to be talking more about later, um, as that sort of factors into that whole idea, that really could shake up the, the way that we look at what, what owning a car means. Uh, it may be something that you only have a couple of days a week or maybe even only a couple of hours a week. Um, and so ultimately, you know, that's that's GM providing a little bit of security for itself. It's GM showing that this is this is an actual trend. It's not just a, a quick hit or something that's going to go away in a few years. And ultimately, it should give them um, better footing as they go forward. And also, we're seeing companies like GM make big moves in cybersecurity as well, which is positive. They, they made some strong uh, statements and some strong partnerships on that front, too, basically being a little bit more open and willing to work with um, cybersecurity researchers, which is interesting. They were the first auto manufacturer to actually really reach out and, and say, you know, we want to hear your bug reports. We want to hear when you find a flaw in our cars and we want to work with you. Um, and that also is, is encouraging because that, you know, is another big story that's going to be developing over the next couple of years. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting when I get into conversation with my oldest daughter, she's six, you know, going on 13, basically. Uh, but when, she, you know, when she talks about when I, you know, when I, when, when I'm older, am I going to be able to drive a car like you? And I'm like, you know, probably, but you <laughs> might not own a car. You know, you might not even need to drive it because the cars might drive themselves. It's a strange, strange kind of transition that seems to be happening right now. Hard yeah, to explain. There are, there are a lot of people who expect, in fact, Lyft CEO says that he doesn't believe his kids will, will ever get driver's licenses. And there's a lot of reason to believe that you probably won't need to. Um, but certainly I don't think that means that if you want to drive that you won't be able to. Right. Uh, it's just a question of where you'll be able to and how often you'll be able to. I could definitely see a situation in the pretty near future where you actually wouldn't be allowed to drive into New York City, for example. Uh, that, I think, is pretty realistic to happen in the near future. Hmm. But in more rural a areas, I think I think that's going to be a long way off. And even then, people still ride horses and that kind of thing. And yeah. that's that's a very um, antiquated means of transportation at this point. For sure. So uh, back in late March, Elon Musk took to the stage at its Hawthorne, uh, California design studio, uh, Tesla's that is, uh, to finally unveil the Tesla 3. It's a four-door vehicle that the company hopes is going to bring help to bring electric cars to a more massive mass market audience. It starts at $35,000, has a range of 215 miles, scheduled to begin delivering to some of those who pre-ordered by the end of 2017, so still another year away. Um, Tim, you were you were involved with kind of the official unveiling. What was the general reaction from people who were there for this kind of this eager, you know, eagerly awaited announcement? Yeah, I, I was lucky enough to be there for the unveiling, and that was, that was a pretty amazing event. Um, it was I think the event that made me realize just how strong the the loyalty for Tesla is, um, it really felt like going to an Apple event. You know, I've been lucky enough to cover a lot of iPhone launches over the years. And the buzz that I was seeing on Twitter and on other social networks that night was as strong as I've seen, you know, at those iPhone launches, iPad launches, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And that was pretty remarkable. Um, but, of course, this is a very different product. And, and instead of saying you'll be able to go to your Apple store in two weeks and buy it. It was give us your money now and maybe you'll get one in two years. That's a very different sort of story. <laughs> um, but still, the amount of pre-orders they got on that car, you know, shattered records, the amount of money they raised that night is is, is pretty amazing. And, and the amount of hype around that car is is uh, is, is absolutely remarkable. Um, but yeah, I was lucky enough to go for a, a very brief ride in the car that night. And um, everything that I saw at the time looked, looked very nice. It was still a very early prototype, of course. Um, but the, the car looks beautiful. It's it's a more um, it's a, a, a more svelte, tighter design than the Model S, which I think is a little bit bulbous from certain angles. It's is noticeably smaller, but still very comfortable inside. The performance should be great. Um, we've we've seen an updated range figure from Elon Musk since then. That's going to be well over 200 miles on a charge, which is great. Uh, and overall, it seems like it's going to hit the right marks. But of course, the only question is when are we actually going to see them on the roads? Has have the um, kind of the news that's been hitting here and there about, you know, delays in shipment and that sort of stuff. Is that affecting any of the anticipation of this or is it because I mean, anytime you're talking about literally years down the line before you get this thing you paid for, I have to imagine that affects people in some ways. But I mean, is it negative? It, yeah, it definitely has been. You know, there, there was always a lot of skepticism around when this car is going to come out. Tesla's never really hit any of its own deadlines, and there's really no reason to believe that, that the Model 3 will be any different. Um, so there was skepticism to begin with. Uh, and, and of course, this is a bit of a different situation because they weren't saying that everybody's going to get their car at the end of 2017. They're they saying they're going to start delivering some cars. Right. And when you've given hundreds of thousands of pre orders and you've got to start to do the math and figure that a lot of people aren't going to see their cars until. 2018 uh, or maybe even later. Um, so as we've 
read about uh, delays at the Gigafactory, which is their major battery manufacturing facility outside of Reno, Nevada, uh, and other production headaches and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, there's definitely a lot of reason to believe that if indeed they do get some cars out by the end of next year, which I think they will, uh, they'll be very limited in numbers. And, and ultimately, the majority of the people who pre-ordered their cars are probably looking at 18 months or more from now before they can even think about uh, actually maybe actually getting a car. Am I remembering correctly that your wife ordered one or did I make that up? She did. Yes. She was, was messaging me during the event asking me if I should, if she should go for it or not. And I was like, I, I, it looks pretty cool to me, but go ahead and do what you want to do. But, but she did ultimately pre-order one and her parents also pre-ordered one, which was pretty interesting to me because they are uh, very fiscally conservative people. And to, to put down a thousand dollars on uh, something that's a couple years away um, was, was pretty interesting to me, but uh, it kind of shows the, the amount of, uh, amount of excitement that there is for Absolutely. some really genuinely new means of transportation. Yeah. And so do you have any, does she have any idea when she's going to get it? Is there, and there's no, there's no word. No, I mean, if you're one of the very early people to actually go into stores and pre-order, then, then you were kind of given some indication of where you fell in the ranking. But if you did an online pre-order later that day, they haven't even given out any kind of number to indicate where you fall. Uh, so really, it was a matter of looking at the ticker that was going kind of crazy live on their site and guessing where you were when you pre-ordered. Uh, but they haven't given any updates or any sort of indication to, to anybody. Um, so it's still a lot of guesswork at this point. Mm. And if someone wants, if they change, like if she changes her mind and buys something else, can you, you get your money back, right? Yes, you can get your money back. Um, it's a little unclear whether or not you can actually sell your position in line. There's, been, I've seen some debates and discussions on that. I'm honestly not clear whether that's possible. Uh, but yes, you can get your money back if you choose not to pre-order them. Awesome. Well, smart cars are going to require some smart cities. And this year, U.S. Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox held a smart city challenge. The finalists were announced at CES uh, at S South by Southwest in March. Uh, and the winner was announced in October. And what can you tell us about this challenge? And talk a little bit about what smart cities of the future will look like. Yeah, this is something that isn't discussed a lot when you talk about autonomous cars. Everyone talks about, you know, uh, laser scanners and cameras and radar sensors and things to make cars smarter. But ultimately, they need to be able to talk to the cities and to the infrastructure and learn more about what's going on around them, more than they can see. Uh, and so that's what this initiative is really about. It's it's adding the smarts that the community, that the highways and that everything else needs to be able to support these autonomous cars when they do come to the road. Uh, we're talking about um, smart traffic lights, for example, that can communicate um, to cars that are coming, uh, talking about um, systems within DOT infrastructure so that they could report lane closures to autonomous cars, um, and, and lots of other things like that that ultimately would allow these cars to effectively see around the corners, to see miles down the road, and to know what's coming in a much better way. Um, so these are largely based on vehicle to vehicle communications and what's called vehicle to infrastructure communications, basically the car having a wireless communication directly to the DOT of the city to get those updates. Um, we're talking about a lot of antennas, a lot of um, e equipment that's going to be, excuse me, that's going to be required to enable these sorts of communications. Uh, and that's going to cost a lot of money. So the DOT is basically trying to figure out what sort of systems are going to be required, how much it's going to cost to do a deployment, uh, how long they'll last, uh, how many do you need, and all sorts of things like that. And so that was the, the genesis behind this Smart City Challenge, was basically giving uh, a pretty large grant to a specific mid-sized city to give them basically a head start on this so that the DOT can learn what other cities will need to be able to do this. Uh, there were a number of finalists. Uh, Austin, Texas was one of them. Columbus, Ohio, Denver, Kansas City, Pittsburgh, Portland, and San Francisco. Uh, the winner was Columbus, Ohio, which means they get a $40 million grant and a lot of um, technical expertise to start to deploy this hardware in the city. And that in theory will mean that Columbus will be kind of a, a bit of a mecca for autonomous testing because they'll have a lot of this vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communication stuff before anybody else does. Um, but that should give uh, sort of a template that other cities can then look to deploy as these cars become uh, more commonplace. Yeah, it seems to be the overarching goal, something like this. Although $40 million doesn't seem to me to be a heck of a lot of money if you're literally yeah. converting a city uh, into a smart city. But I suppose it's a start. Uh, 2016 has been the year of GeoHot. That's George Hotz, the guy who jailbroke the iPhone back in its infancy and broke through Sony PlayStation 3's security protection. Uh, well, he took his uh, vibrant, energetic persona, if you've ever seen him talk, you know what I'm talking about, to South by Southwest and unveiled Comma.ai, his new self-driving car company that he said could build a better self-driving car than Tesla. The gauntlet 
thrown down. And then throughout the year, Commodat AI uh, trickled out information about the self-driving car kit with promises to bring it to consumers by the end of the year. But the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration came along with their rules and vision of human safety. And ultimately, <laughs> Commodat AI canceled its Comma One product before it ever launched. Uh, Tim, how surprised were you when Comma AI canceled things so soon after that request? And why do you think they did it? Um, it was definitely an interesting sequence. We'd actually just um, done an, an interview with George not that long before, and um, and the, which was always an interesting experience on its own. Yes. Uh, but you know, we, we were left having a lot of questions about the, the viability of this platform. You know, the idea that you could spend a thousand dollars and plug something into your car and make it autonomous is a bit fanciful to begin with. But uh, we had a lot of questions about uh, legality and regulation and everything else. And it turns out NHTSA did as well, as you mentioned. Um, so it, it was basically the, the instant that there was any sort of notion that the government was curious about what was going on was enough for, for George to say, Okay, that's enough. I'm not going to bother doing this anymore. So at that point, he announced that it was done. The project was over. Um, but actually, just yesterday, uh, he gave an update to us and actually showed us a new version of the hardware, basically taking everything and moving it into a smartphone. Uh, he showed it off in a OnePlus 3, basically sitting inside of a 3D printed uh, enclosure that now sits uh, basically where your rearview mirror would be in the car. The idea is rather than selling a $1,000 kit, um, now he wants to give the whole thing away. Um, so it's a very different, it's a, a <laughs> rather <laughs> radical uh, shift in, in business uh, tactic, that's for sure, especially giving away your hardware open source. Uh, but it's an interesting idea. Basically, your smartphone would turn into a, an autonomous pallet for your car. Um, I'm still skeptical about the ability for the camera in your phone, for example, to be good enough to identify lanes in all situations, especially shining through a windshield. Um, but that's the basic idea for the thing. But now it's open source, so anybody can check it out and try to improve on the design. And I'm actually really curious to see uh, what comes of this. So do you think the fact that it's open source leaves it open also for security risks, for car hacking, that sort of thing? I, I don't think that's much of a concern in this case. Uh, the, the way that it's actually interacting with the car is is pr pretty well known at this point through the OBD2 port. Um, and so really, there's no way for someone to take this kit effectively and, and wirelessly connect to someone's car, for example, and do something do something nefarious. Uh, you'd have to actually have some kind of a port plugged into your car for that to work. So I think that it will get more people uh, looking into how to control these sorts of cars and maybe, you know, as a byproduct, they'll learn how to do something nefarious if they wanted to. Uh, but ultimately, I don't think this gives anybody any extra keys that, that weren't out there before. What do you know about the app that's on the comma.ai websites, Dash, train self-driving cars? Like I downloaded it on my iPhone. Um, it looks to be something that just, is it, is it help, like I'm helping uh, map the roads, that sort of thing? Yeah, the basic idea was uh, George Hoss was going to get a lot of people to download and run this app uh, and basically run it on their phone, lo looking forward and effectively giving more data to them to, to to basically train their systems. The big thing when you're training an autonomous car is you need millions and millions and millions of miles so that you can then basically train the car, what a, a road sign looks like, what a dog in the street looks like, what a bicyclist looks like. Uh, and a really easy way to do that, or a great way to do that, is to basically crowdsource and get lots of other people to do it. So mm -hmm. basically, that's just training the the, the system, uh, and that they can then rely on that data to to make it smarter. At the Google AI Developers Conference in May, the company previewed a smartphone version of Android Auto that would let you use the interface even if you didn't have an Android Auto compatible car. Later in this year, the, the feature actually launched. With one tap on the screen of your phone, you can now access Android Auto, which offers a limited choice of larger, easy-to-tap buttons, including navigation, music, and more. The idea is that you would not be distracted or you would be less distracted. Mm -hmm. Is this something you use regularly, Tim? I do, actually, yeah. Uh, I have actually retrofitted my Subaru with a new uh, infotainment system that actually supports Android Auto through the car itself, so I have the full-on Android Auto experience there. Uh, but in a lot of the other cars that I test, they don't offer Android Auto, so I've been using this quite a bit lately to have the Android Auto experience um, without necessarily having a full-on head unit, which is actually really, really helpful. Um, to be able to access all, all the same smarts, all the same navigation and everything else. 
um, and do it in a non-distracting, easy to use way, in a way that you can use largely by voice too, which is great. Um, so basically you can be compliant with your local state's laws and also have a lot of the annoying notifications that you get from Facebook and from Twitter and from everything else, they're all suppressed as part of this, which I think is great. Um, so I've been using it quite a bit and it works really, really well. Um, the, the best thing is they've recently added OK Google functionality to it. That actually wasn't there when they first uh, launched this on-phone version of Android Auto a couple of weeks ago, but they just turned that on uh, actually I think at the beginning of this week. So now you can fully hands-free interact with Android Auto on your phone. You can program it so that it will automatically launch when you start your car by connecting to the car's Bluetooth and turn itself off again as soon as you get out of the car. Uh, it, it's really, really a great implementation. And I would like to see Apple do the same thing with CarPlay, but uh, I'm a little bit skeptical that they'll take the same approach. Mm -hmm. There seems to be this kind of blurry line when I look at, at things like this. I'm really happy that this and and apps like it exist for, you know, ho hopefully helping people kind of curb the um, the desire to, t to fool with their phones while they're driving. In many places, that's illegal to even touch your phone yeah. while you're driving, including mm -hmm. here in California. Um, so I'm happy that this this category and this this type of app exists. But I feel like there's this weird kind of blurry line because I think I saw a couple of weeks ago that like Facebook, for example, has, you know, built into their their app um, some sort of kind of way to channel the notifications into Android Auto so that it works with the interface there. But I mean, we really shouldn't be looking at Facebook while we're driving at all. It doesn't matter if it's bigger text on a screen. It's that's not the point. But yet we're, it's OK for us to touch things like, you know, uh, climate control and radio. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what my question is there, but I feel like it's this very kind of strange, <laughs> strange line that's being straddled right now. Where do you think this is yeah. going to end up? And there have definitely been some double standards where, yeah. you know, tuning an old AM radio station with a dial was a very user intensive process to get that exactly perfect if you were dealing with a, a station that was pretty far away. But that, of course, was perfectly legal and nobody thought anything of it. Uh, but yet touching a button on your phone, of course, is not legal. Um, and anything that does go through Android Auto will be compliant with the distraction guidelines here in the U.S., meaning they won't take your eyes away from the road for more than a given amount of time. Uh, and the en engineers have actually been very careful to make sure that button sizes are appropriate, even if you do have an older phone that isn't as, as giant as a lot of the newer ones are. Um, so they have definitely been taking all that into consideration. And the fact that you can use it by voice is great, too. Right. But certainly, you know, I think there's any time that you're reaching out to touch your phone, even if it is in a legal way, there's probably going to be temptation for people to just exit that app and launch Facebook and cruise around while they're driving, which, which of course, is bad news. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, autonomous vehicles, obviously an ongoing thread throughout the year. Part of the growing pains as we transition into a world filled with computer controlled vehicles is the fact that sometimes things are going to go wrong. Back in May, Joshua Brown was driving his Tesla Model S in Florida when he activated autopilot mode. The sensors were blinded by the bright sky and ultimately led the vehicle into a collision with an 18 wheel truck and trailer as it crossed the highway. Um, Tim, with the in introduction of new technology like this, there will always kind of be some scenario where things go wrong. Is this no different than when, you know, vehicles were first introduced way back when it's just kind of growing pains? Yeah, it definitely is. Um, and if you look at the, the massive adoption of this service and how many millions of miles and hours that have been logged using autopilot, it's easy to say that there have been lives saved by the service. The problem is that there's really no way to prove that or no way to show that. Um, and of course, it doesn't help the fact that unfortunately an individual lost their life in this case, which is right. a tragic situation regardless. So there's ultimately no good way to look at this. It's a tragic situation. It's very unfortunate. But ultimately, um, I hope that people don't think that this means that we should stop doing research into these, these sorts of tools. Uh, but maybe it does mean that we need to be a little bit more careful about how we're marketing them, how we're presenting them, and indeed how we are enabling them. Um, Tesla indeed made some pretty significant changes to how autopilot works based on the reaction from this accident, which I think was a positive move. Uh, and ultimately, I think that every other manufacturer is looking and has been looking at the reaction from this crash. Uh, and ultimately, they're using that to, to drive their own adoption and, and deployment of these technologies in their own cars. How much emphasis do you think can be placed on the kind of the consumer expectations of, of how these things are labeled? Ob obviously, autopilot has uh, has been a confusing terminology for some people, even though Tesla has gone, gone, they say, to, you know, pretty great lengths to educate consumers on what it actually is. I mean, there's there's always that that kind of level of expectation that a consumer just kind of assumes what something is. Um, I don't know. What do you think about right. that? Yeah, I, I do think that there have been a few cases where 
Elon Musk has tweeted things that were a bit hyperbolic or a bit um, overstating things. Uh, but ultimately, if you look at the the messaging that Tesla itself has put out, and certainly if you look at the documentation for the systems, um, there's really no exaggeration going on there. But if you look at the uh, the local news reports in particular that have been reporting on these services, a lot of them call Tesla's self-driving cars, for example, which is totally untrue. Um, and so I think that, you know, I don't think it's necessarily Tesla being at fault in this case, but certainly there has been this expectation set or this this idea set that these are self-driving cars on the roads already, which which simply isn't true. So I think that we we as journalists have a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that people understand exactly what these systems can do, and hopefully we can help um, help other journalists and other people who aren't really uh, that in touch with the automotive technology scene understand that these systems have their limitations, and and ultimately then it falls back to Tesla too to make sure that. There are systems in place to make sure that people aren't exploiting them. And indeed, that's what Tesla deployed. They had a version 8 update to their autopilot software this year, which basically made the system turn itself off if you are found to be exploiting it. So if, if it has to remind you to put your hands on the wheel too many times, it shuts itself off and you can't turn it on again until you park the car. Uh, little things like that, I think, actually go a long, long way to, to help people to really appreciate what these systems are for and make sure that they're not misusing them either intentionally or unintentionally. Yeah. Well, speaking of self-driving cars, Uber had previously promised that they would have self-driving cars on the road by the end of 2016, and they delivered, sort of. In September <laughs> of this year, Uber held a secret event where pre-selected journalists were allowed to take a ride in one of a fleet of self-driving Ubers. The car still had a steering wheel and a technician in the car. Uh, some of the reporters we talked to after said it wasn't the smoothest of rides. Uh, and since then, Uber has been operating these self-driving taxis for riders who opt in and sign an agreement, waiving their right to sue if they get in an accident. Uh, do you have any idea how the robot Ubers are doing in Pittsburgh? No, we haven't heard too many reports. Uh, I don't believe there have been any crashes, so that's good news. But uh, but certainly at this point, it's still pretty early days, obviously, that they've got engineers in the car. So these aren't true self-driving cars. They are basically prototypes, and they're having people kind of ride along and give feedback, um, which I think is, is not a bad thing so long as there is an engineer in the car. But ultimately, there are a lot of companies right now that have cars that can drive themselves in limited situations um, and do so legally so long as someone is in the car to monitor them. Um, so that's not really a huge step forward in that regard. But ultimately, I think that we all understand that that this is the way forward for these uh, ride sharing services this is what they want to do um a lot of the issues that uber has had in, in in growing up as as big and as quickly as it has have been related to either labor issues from their drivers or safety issues from their riders and a lot of that if not all of that goes away by by having the cars drive themselves Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so in a way, they're just doing exactly what Google's doing with their self-driving cars, except they're getting paid by people to do it. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, I'm hoping they're offering a bit of a discount. Yeah, I wondered that as well. So, yeah, they're roof, they're just we're looking at a little bit. There's a roof mounted array of cameras, GPS receivers, LIDAR. So it's pretty much it's very similar to the Google self-driving car, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And this is based on a partnership with Carnegie Mellon, which is great. You know, one of the leading AI researchers in the world is right there. So that's a great place for them to be doing this research. And they have a lot of expertise to tap into. Um, now, my wife, I'm pretty certain, spotted one of these in SF. Even though I've, mm -hmm. I've heard that this is happening in Pittsburgh, she, she swears that she saw an Uber vehicle with this technology on top and that it was self-driving. I mean, is that just more like a, a like, would that be an internally controlled thing as opposed to obviously a public uh, scenario? Probably so. It, it could also be a mapping car, basically doing some scanning uh, of the roads to get more information been, yeah. about uh, city streets, because that looks pretty much the same. In fact, it's mm -hmm. basically the same technology doing laser scanning and, uh, and, and imaging of city streets. So it, it could have been one of those cars, but there certainly are self-driving cars testing in San Francisco. Uh, GM has uh, autonomous bolts that are driving around at this point. So there are there are cars in the city to be seen for sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, one way that Uber proved its dedication to autonomous vehicle technology was buying the company Auto, a company that came out of stealth in May and demonstrated in a video how it could enable big rig trucks to be retrofitted with a self-driving kit to command the rigs on the freeway. Uh, that would give the driver the ability to literally step into the back of the cab and take a rest. Tim, uh, was this acquisition about self-driving trucks or was it about accelerating their own development of self-driving technology uh, for all of Uber's needs? What do you think? Probably a bit of a mixture of both. Uh, it's a little hard to know exactly what direction they want to go in, but I think that um, trucking is definitely one of the larger applications that we'll be seeing very early on. Uh, you know, ride sharing 
in major cities should be something that we see pretty quickly because major cities are pretty well defined in terms of uh, of street lights and road grids and, and that kind of thing. And trucking is another major one because once you get a car on the highway at that point, it's pretty easy to make it stay in lane and, and not hit anything. Um, and of course, there are a lot of things being transported by truck in the U.S. So if you can make that process safer, cheaper, um, and, and ultimately more efficient, um, then there's a lot of money to be saved. So I think Uber quite rightly thinks that there is uh, a lot of money to be made if they can be one of the first, if not the first, into the autonomous trucking world. Uh, and and I think that um, this is definitely a great investment for them to be getting there. There's definitely a lot of question about the nature of this investment, uh, whether it was for the technology or for the, the engineers involved. Um, and that, that I think we'll probably not find out the answers on for another six or 12 months, if not more. But, uh, but ultimately, uh, autonomous trucking is definitely expected to be a very big thing. And it should be something that comes in the pretty near future. We later learned that the test drive that was shown in the video that Otto released in May was done without any official, uh, official adherence to Nevada's regulations. How <laughs> did that discovery strike you uh, in light of everything? Uh, not particularly surprising, to be perfectly honest. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of testing going on, and ultimately, you know, it, it's a little bit hard to tell if a given car is being driven by an actual human being or if the human being is simply sitting behind the wheel and, and yeah, you know true. reading a book, that kind of thing these days. So I think there's a lot more going on uh, in, in that area than than we think. But ultimately, not everybody is filming themselves and putting it on the internet, which is probably a good thing. Uh, so I think that was the biggest um, kind of stupid thing here is that they made a big deal out of it, which was a little bit unfortunate. It's not that hard to get your autonomous vehicle registered in, in Nevada. I don't know why they didn't bother. Well, it seems like there's something really fishy going on. There was a medium piece just a couple weeks ago about this. Um, and it seemed like they were just really riding the very edge of the regulations. And maybe some of the engineers that developed auto actually developed these regulations. There was just, you know, there's there's like, it's, it seems like a little bit of um, lobby, basically Google lobbyists are the ones making these regulations. And I think in the Nevada <laughs> case, it was, they, there, it was against the law to have no one in the cab, but there was no punishment for the law. Like they hadn't finished writing the regulations or something. Do you see a lot yeah. of that going on? And does it frighten you? There's a huge amount of that going on. And that's one of the bigger issues that, that I think is really going to slow down autonomous development here in the U.S., which is a really unfortunate thing, is that each state really has total control over the laws of the land when it comes to their highways. Um, when it comes to the safety of the car, there's a lot of federal regulation that dictates things about mirror size and um, brake operation and that kind of thing. But when it comes to speed limits and, and uh, right-of-way rules and things like that, that's all pretty much controlled by the states. And so when it comes to autonomous any kind of regulation or legislation there, that's, again, all state-based. So we're seeing very different things as you go from one state to the next. In some states, it's completely illegal. In some states, they have no laws at all on the, on the books. California has a very stringent policy where you need to have cars registered and give reports every month. So that's uh, definitely a very difficult thing. If you want to have an autonomous car that you're testing from coast to coast right now, you kind of can't, and that's a big, big, big issue. Mm -hmm. In Europe, uh, it's getting to be much easier to be doing your testing there. And if the U.S. doesn't come up with a, a, a means for the federal government to step in and say, hey, guys, this is what it's going to look like. All of you guys need to play along. If they can't do that, then we are at a real risk of falling behind with autonomous development in a big way. And that would be pretty unfortunate, given we've been on the cutting edge of this stuff. Chevy unveiled their practically priced electric car, the Bolt, at CES in January of this year. And then they showed off some more details at the North American Auto Show. The vehicle was supposed to be available this fall, but hit a few snags along the way. They promised to deliver some by the end of the year, but most are delayed. Also, a report last month in Bloomberg says the company could stand to lose $9,000 on each Bolt they deliver. Uh, what's going on here, Tim? Uh <laughs> The Bolt, first of all, I think is a great car and it's pretty exciting. Um, I've had the chance to drive it a few times now and it drives really nicely. So I think that this could be a big car. But yeah, as you mentioned, uh, they're going to be a little bit slow coming to market. Uh, they will get some out to dealerships, I think, by the end of the year. But ultimately, it's not going to be until probably middle of next year that you could really hope to potentially pick one of these up. Um, but uh, as far as them losing money... That's actually not that rare a situation. If you look at cars like the Nissan Leaf when that first came out and other um, kind of progressive EVs, a lot of those cars were losing money too, um, simply because battery packs are very expensive. And because these companies really need more miles on these cars, they need to know what the reliability issues are of these cars, how the battery packs hold up after years and years and years, what things break, what things that they need to improve. And Honestly, how often are they actually getting used and how far people are going in them? Um, this is all really valuable information for them. So even if they are 
losing money up front on the sale of that car, uh, that data that they get back from the usage of those cars can actually be very valuable. And that will help them to make sure that the next generation of EVs that they develop will hopefully be profitable, uh, but will also be perfectly targeted to how people are actually using them. And so that's partly why you're seeing this. People, they want GM wants to get this car to market. They want it to be price competitive with the Model 3 and with others. Uh, and they want to learn what they need to do for Bolt 2.0. So obviously, my question is maybe outside of just the Bolt and, and more to kind of the broader spectrum of all electric vehicles and the kind of the trend that's happening right now. Uh, obviously, a big push towards uh, electric vehicles uh, recently. But as we know, new presidential administration coming in, we could be looking at a shifting kind of perspective on things like climate change that have you know largely mm -hmm. been driving the push to electric vehicles. Do you think this trend toward electric is going to continue if that happens? Is it just kind of it's too too late to put that genie back in the bottle and this is the future? <laughs> uh, well, I'll I'll, I'll have a, a good and a bad perspective on that. So we can keep things balanced, I think, fair sure. and balanced here. Sure. <laughs> uh, on one hand, absolutely, um, the, the Trump administration has made it pretty clear that they are um, not exactly um, the the biggest believers in climate change science. And so ultimately, you know, there's a lot of reason to believe that any sort of attempts at, at reducing carbon emissions will probably not be of major importance to that administration going forward. Uh, and certainly that's been a major driver of EV adoption and, and a lot of the federal funding we've seen pushing EVs is to help cut the overall carbon emissions within the U.S. And so I think there's definitely a lot of reason to believe that that those incentives, um, maybe not that they'll be canceled, but ultimately that they probably won't be renewed. So that's definitely a, a, a reason to be pessimistic. But there is actually reason to be optimistic, a couple of reasons. For one thing, Trump has made it very clear that he wants to reduce our dependency on foreign oil. Mm -hmm. Of course, EVs don't burn oil. So that's a good thing. Uh, also, um, Trump is very much in favor of um, increasing the U.S. dependence on coal. Actually, and a lot of electricity in the U.S. comes from the burning of coal. Um, so increasing our dependence on coal, uh, ironically, could actually result in us having more EVs on the road because they're effectively burning coal in a very distributed, strange way. So um, there is some reason for optimism, for sure. I think ultimately the reduction of dependency on foreign oil is the big thing to lean on. But um, while EVs may not have an environmental um, reasoning behind them. I don't think that ultimately um, the progression and the advancement of EVs will stop. Good. Uh, from electric charge to hybrid fuel, Honda's Clarity Fuel Cell converts hydrogen fuel into electricity. Tim, tell us a little bit about how that's being achieved under the hood here. This is really cool. Yeah, fuel cells are definitely a very exciting thing. I think we've been reading about fuel cells forever. Um, but the big news is that, that Honda is actually putting a production model, and they've, they've got a production model that, that can be purchased now, at least in California. Uh, but basically, it is an electric car, so it's an electric motor that runs off of an electric battery. But that battery is charged up while you drive um, based on hydrogen that's run through a fuel cell. So the, the system can effectively split the hydrogen, uh, pumps a little bit of water out the tailpipe, and takes the electricity to charge the battery. So it's effectively charging itself as you drive using the electrons that come out of the hydrogen. And it's it's a nice car. I mean, it's a little bit weird looking for sure, but it's uh, basically a standard family sedan. Drives very nicely, has kind of comparable range that you would expect from a gasoline powered car. Um, the sort of torque and smoothness that you expect from an EV. And you can fuel it up in about five or six minutes, which is uh, which is pretty great, too. So it's an exciting concept. Um, some big issues. One cost about sixty thousand dollars. And two, there are fuel stations numbered in the, the dozens in the state of California, if that even. <laughs> so um, if you don't happen to live near one, uh, that's a bit of a problem. Yeah. And, uh, oh, by the way, you can drink the tailpipe emissions because it's pure water. Would you do that, Tim? <laughs> Um, I have not had the opportunity. I would probably do it. I don't know how it would taste, but uh, sure, I'd give it a shot. If it were a new car, if it were, you know, a couple yeah. thousand miles on the road, mm, maybe not. <laughs> I mean, That's it true. would probably depend on how thirsty you are too, right? Totally. Too. Yeah. It could be a good totally. emergency stash. Mm -hmm. of, yeah. It's true, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the Mirai is also something that I was really interested in. That's the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle from Toyota. Uh, and Nikola One announced the first hydrogen-powered semi-truck. What do we know about the Nikola One? Yeah, that is uh, a very interesting company that we're still learning about. Uh, I think um, there's reason for skepticism there too. But, but Nikola One basically is attempting to do for trucking what Tesla has done for kind of the luxury car segment. So they unveiled a, a very large, uh, very powerful hydrogen powered um, truck that could be used for trucking. It looks like a very interesting thing. I mean, it looks like a standard truck, but kind of 
push forward about 20 years. Uh, and it's it's an emissions-free means of trucking your goods from coast to coast. Effectively, it's got a thousand horsepower, which is pretty cool, and more than enough torque to um, to pull, you know, a typical trailer's worth of uh, concrete or cars or or anything else. So, um, the potential there is great. I think we haven't really seen any kind of long-range and high-power uh, applications for EVs and fuel cell cars, and so that's great. But probably the better news, as far as, as they're promising, is to actually create a network of hydrogen filling stations across the country. Uh, obviously, if you have a truck like this, you can't drive it coast to coast without filling it up a few times. Um, so they want to create a network of these stations that'll be scattered around the US. And not only will their trucks be able to use it, but anybody who has a hydrogen powered car will be able to use it, which is good news for both Toyota and Honda. Mm -hmm. Well, Tim, is there anything we missed? Any uh, predictions you have to make about the future of cars? Man, I think that was pretty comprehensive. So no, I think uh, I think we probably hit all the big stories of 2016. Uh, for 2017, I'm uh, definitely excited to see where Android Auto and and Apple CarPlay take us. Uh, I think we're just beginning to see the the kind of potential there. And, and ultimately, I hope that those systems become more commonplace. That could mean actually a lot of lives saved. Um, we'll see more and more advancements on autonomy. Volvo will have their fully self driving car and testing in uh, in Sweden next year, which is exciting to see too. Uh, and we'll see more and more of these semi-autonomous systems coming to more affordable cars, which I think is great news, too. So I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff to look forward to next year for car tech. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Tim Stevens from CNET's Roadshow. You can see his videos, uh, read his work, watch his daily show. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Tim. And you can follow Tim on Twitter at Tim Stevens. Tim underscore Stevens. Tim I got to remember the yeah. special character. Yep. And That's right. Instagram and Facebook, if you want to see that steady, those steady... Uh, cars just come in new cars every day <laughs> and if you Filing are through. tim's neighbors uh everything's legit it's all cool don't worry about it <laughs> always a pleasure tim thank you so much thanks for joining us i really today. appreciate it all right happy Take holidays have same to day. you uh tomorrow's guest in this continuation of kind of our holiday episodes taking a look back at the year a different focus on different aspects of technology from throughout the year sam muscovich of course, you you are very familiar with Sam from throughout this year from Ars Technica. He's going to talk to us, and we're going to talk all about uh, gaming, virtual reality, all that kind of fun stuff. So something to look forward to there. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us, tnt at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW, and you can find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. And you can find me on Twitter. I am at Megan Maroney. And, and subscribe to our show oh yeah. at twit.tv slash TNT. Definitely do that, twit.tv slash TNT. I am on Twitter, though. You can find me there as well, at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole. Thanks to Mario for coming in and scrolling words on the screen and helping out. Thanks to Kevin for editing always and making us look good. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Woo!